So, dear colleagues, please start our seminar. Uh, today we have a problem with a camera of Professor Domlin, but I think it's not a problem because uh, most important is his presentation and his voice. So, Professor Alexander Domlin studied chemistry and biology at the Technical University of Munich and performed his PhD thesis with Professor Ivar Ugi in 1992. And a further Lyon scholarship awarded by Alexander von Gumbel Foundation, he moved to California and performed his postdoctoral studies with double Nobel laureate uh, Professor Barry Sharpless. Returning back from United States, he co-founded the biotech company Morphochem, where he served as vice president chemistry, uh, overseeing about uh, 50 chemists. In 2003, he performed his habilitation in the Technical University of Munich. From 2006 till 2011, he served first as associate professor, then as full professor at the University of Pittsburgh. In 2010, he became professor and chair of the Department of Drug Design at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. In 2022, he received the prestigious era chair at uh, Palatsky University, awarded by the European Union. And from 2023, he will be working on Olomouc, Czech Republic. Influenced by his great teachers, Ivar Ugi and Betty Sharpless, he investigates novel, more sustainable ways to perform synthetic chemistry, automation plus min miniaturization, equal acceleration, is the mantra in his laboratory. He has published more than 300 papers, more than 10 books and book chapters, and applied for 70 patents. In fact, he is a listed among the top two most influenced scientists worldwide. By the way, he visited Ukraine and Kharkiv to take part in uh, as a plenary speaker in conference chemistry of nitrogen containing heterocycles. And dear Alex, please. Yes, uh, Valentin, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to give a seminar. This is a great pleasure and honor for me. And um, indeed, I was uh, in Kharkiv uh, several times uh, in the past, not only at this uh, heterocycle conference, but uh, I was, I, I remember I was there at least three times. And um, yes, you was two times, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was always very pleasant. And uh, hopefully this can happen soon again if this terrible war is over. <clears throat> okay, so um, I will give you in this seminar a little bit of, of an overview of what we are currently doing in my lab. And uh, there is also uh, two works I will show you today, which are not yet published. Um, and uh, this uh, picture here, what you see is uh, a kind of um, what I envision future chemistry labs uh, might look like. Uh, this is something I was drawing by myself, so <laughs> forgive me. Um, so I would like to, uh, okay, I would like to start uh, with um, my two uh, teachers, which uh, deeply influenced uh, me in my work and uh, so the first one is uh, Ivar Karl Ugi which you see here on this picture um, he was uh, born in uh, 1935 uh, on the island uh, Sarema in Estonia and he died uh, unfortunately much too early in 2005 in Munich um, I also give you a short, uh, brief um, biography, because uh, I think it's quite interesting. So due to the uh, Soviet uh, occupation of Estonia uh, during the Second World War, his family fled to Germany. And in Germany, he studied chemistry and mathematics, interestingly, at the University of Tübingen, and later in the uh, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. Um, he performed his habilitation with Rolf Huisken, uh, which uh, died also, I think, this year or last year, um, and uh, which uh, unfortunately could not get the Nobel Prize uh, for the click reaction, but instead uh, Sharpless was getting the Nobel Prize for the click reaction. Um, 
so uh, yeah, Rolf Huisken did not only describe uh, the three plus two cycle addition of uh, azides uh, on triple bonds and double bonds, but he uh, discovered uh, many different uh, three plus two cycle additions uh, and described them. So later, uh, Iwa Ugi became a Forschungsleiter, uh, research head at the Bayer um, uh, main lab, uh, Hauptlabor in Leverkusen. And uh, then in the end of the 1960s, he followed a professorship at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Thereafter, he earned the, the Lehrstuhl one for Organic Chemie uh, from Friedrich Weigand at the Technical University of Munich. Um, starting in 1959, in just a few years, Iwa Ugi described almost all important variation of his uh, multi-component reaction. And the general scheme of this uh, Ugi multi four-component reaction is shown here. So you have a, a primary or secondary amine, you have an aldehyde or a ketone, an isocyanide, very importantly, and you have a nucleophile. And depending on the, on the nature of the nucleophile XH, the acid component, um, we get different types of re rearrangement. Uh, but uh, the intermediate uh, um, um, uh, compound which is formed is this uh, nitrillium ion, which is, uh, of course, an unstable compound, which is shown here in the brackets. And then the anion X minus uh, of the acid is attacking the carbon of the former isocyanide and we get this intermediate and uh, depending again on the nature of the X, we get uh, different types of uh, rearrangements. And the different types of rearrangements are shown here in the second line. So we have the, here the carboxylic acid, R6 uh, is a carboxylic acid and then we get uh, the classical bisimide structure of the UG reaction or we can form tetrazole, pseudantrines, uh, uh, TO imides, uh, seleno imides, uh, or normal imides, alpha amino imides, uh, then uh, um, we can get uh, these type of structures here as well. And uh, in the bottom yellow uh, box, you see the applications of uh, the UGI reaction, which are meanwhile quite considerable. So this uh, compound is a, is a FDA approved uh, anti-cancer drug, which uh, got approval last year. And uh, as you can see, it has the structure of a bismite and it was uh, discovered, uh, but it is also produced uh, on, on, a, on a large scale on hundreds and uh, hundreds of kilograms uh, per, um, per year uh, for, for, for the treatment uh, of cancer. And then uh, in the middle, we have uh, Praziquantel, which is a uh, anti-helminthic uh, compound, which can be produced by the UGI reaction or atorvastatin, which is, uh, which is a compound uh, for the uh, lowering of the blood uh, uh, fat. Uh, and uh, this is a very good selling compound, uh, blockbuster. And uh, on the right hand side, you see xylocaine. And xylocaine was uh, the first time, first time synthesized by Iwa Ugi in the 1960s by his uh, four component reaction, or in this case, a three component reaction. Then here on the right hand side, you see an application that you can also use this kind of chemistry for uh, in peptide chemistry. So this is a staple peptide where the staple is a, a UGI reaction and, uh, and we could uh, co-crystallize this staple peptide um, with MDM2, which is an anti-cancer protein. And uh, what I also like very much, uh, this is a very, very new um, um, publication from a Chinese group. Uh, what you see here on the left-hand side is a cobalt. Uh, a cobalt uh, salt, uh, a chiral cobalt salt. And with this chiral cobalt salt, uh, which you, basically you can produce in two steps. So first you make the shift phase and then you uh, reflux it uh, with a cobalt salt and then you get uh, precipitation of this uh, catalyst. And this catalyst uh, is able to induce uh, the stereochemistry of the UGI reaction. So if R3 and R4 are different, uh, in, in this scheme here, so aldehydes, for example, uh, different from, from aldehyde, of course, we get the stereocenter in this position. And uh, this position now can be fully controlled by these cobalt salts in very, very good EEs. And also the corresponding tetazole UGI reaction, where you have R3 and R4 different, uh, can be induced uh, stereochemically by this uh, catalyst, uh, very cheap, uh, simple catalyst. 
Okay, and then uh, the second person which uh, influenced me uh, deeply is, of course, uh, Barry Sharpless, uh, who got uh, this year the Nobel Prize uh, for the development of click chemistry and bioorthogonal chemistry. But in my opinion, the more important Nobel Prize was in 2001 when he got uh, the Nobel Prize for chirally catalyzed oxidation reactions or uh, the epoxidation of the allyl allylic positions in alcohols or the dehydroxylation or the amino hydroxylation. All right, so let me show you some things uh, from our lab. Uh, we are one, one, one part of what my lab is doing, we are interested to interested to, to look into uh, commercial compounds, uh, drugs which are already approved. Uh, um, and we are trying to figure out if these kind of compounds can be made in a different way using a multi-component reaction. And what you see here is a, is a compound which is uh, used for the treatment of herpes, herpes zoster. Uh, it's called Aminamivir, and uh, if you have a closer look, of course, you can recognize the motive of the UGI reaction. So Aminamivir is an is a anti-herpes compound, which has currently only approval in Japan, uh, but uh, these comp the company, as far as I know, are trying to get uh, also approval in United States and in Europe, uh, and thereby it will be a, a, a compound a competitor for Articovir and, uh, and similar compounds which are shown here. So um, these are other type of compounds um, which can be made by the UGI reaction as, we already, as I already discussed two slides before. So our way to make uh, Aminamivir is shown here. So it's a one step uh, UGI for component reaction using this carboxylic acid, this highly sterically hindered uh, two, uh, 60 methyl uh, aniline and from aldehyde and uh, and this uh, isocyanide. Uh, so the reaction is uh, running in TFE at uh, 50 degrees Celsius uh, for 12 hours. And uh, in this case, uh, we scale the reaction a little bit. So we could isolate 3.8 gram in 63% yield of, uh, of uh, the final compound. So this, uh, this method uh, compares very well with um, the state of the art methods, which are used to produce uh, uh, the compound for, for, for the clinic. And uh, they are shown here, I will not go through it, but you can see that uh, indeed uh, the, the, the synthesis we are proposing is much shorter and better than the currently used methods. Even if you have to synthesize this uh, non-commercial available isocyanide, but uh, this is uh, rather simple and easy. Um, so we were in here, I want to share a, a couple of uh, crystal structures uh, we were able to get uh, through uh, throughout this uh, project. Uh, first of all, this is the crystal structure of the isocyanide. And uh, I, I'm, I'm showing this here because uh, it shows very nicely the features of isocyanide. So isocyanides uh, have, of course, uh, uh, um, they are linear. So they have an angle of uh, 180 degree between the carbon, the nitrogen and the carbon. And uh, they have a uh, distance between the nitrogen and the carbon of uh, 1.2 angstrom, which is uh, which is of course um, 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 which is of course uh, um, showing that this is a triple bond, uh, the nitrogen carbon uh, uh, bond of the isocyanides. And uh, and uh, if you look into the crystals, uh, I, I I like this very much. Uh, to look always in the crystals, what kind of interactions you have, and then you can see that the carbon of the isocyanides is making three hydrogen bonds, so short bonds uh, to hydrogens uh, in surrounding molecules, two to the oxadiazole moiety of, uh, of the isocyanide, and one to the ortho hydrogen of this uh, aniline derived uh, isocyanide. Uh, so they are all in 2.8, 2.9 angstrom difference, distance. And then we were also able to uh, solve the crystal structure of the drug, the final drug, aminamivir, which you see here. And uh, there is not uh, much special to observe here. The only interesting thing, in my opinion, which is worthwhile to note, is uh, that the phenyl group, uh, due to the sterical hindrance of these uh, two orthometyl groups, uh, is turned uh, out of the uh, coplanarity by 90 degrees. Okay, so in summary, 
this uh, this method is one pot simple. It is green. It is avoiding any type of uh, chlorinated solvents. Uh, we have uh, pretty good yields. Uh, um, I'm sure if we would work a little bit harder, we could even improve the yield uh, and the number of steps. Even if we include the isocyanide synthesis, is much shorter than the current methods to produce the drug. Uh, we have less side products, less inorganic and organic waste, uh, very short time to the product. And uh, if we are comparing the patent described methods, then uh, our method outperforms uh, the described synthesis pathway in terms of sustainability and in terms of costs of wood. So let's... Uh, Let's go back a little bit uh, to the isocyanides. Uh, so isocyanides, uh, this is the uh, functional group which um, we mostly use in my lab. And uh, here in the upper part, um, you have uh, two different uh, formulations, uh, valence formulations of the isocyanide. Uh, so the one where you have a positively charged uh, um, nitrogen and the negatively charged carbon, which are connected by a triple bond. And then we have this carbon type uh, uh, formulation, um, which has a lone pair on the nitrogen, and therefore you would expect uh, that uh, this uh, carbene formulation would lead to an uh, angle which is different from uh, 180 degree, but in fact, uh, the, the, the angle between the carbon nitrogen and the adjacent carbon is 180 degrees, so in my opinion, the better formulation for isocyanides is uh, the left one with the triple bond. So isocyanides are a very unusual functional group in organic chemistry. So they are most, mostly pr produced by the primary amine through formulation and dehydration, or they can be made from the ketones and aldehydes by reductive amination, uh, amidation with formamide and then uh, dehydration. And uh, the three main reaction pathways of isocyanides are shown here. Um, at the bottom. So the most prominent one, which we use mostly in our chemistry, is the addition of an electrophile and a nucleophile on the carbon. So this is something very, very, very unusual. Almost no other functional group in organic chemistry has this feature that the electrophile and the nucleophile is adding on the same atom in the functional group. And then depending on the nature of the electrophile and the nucleophile, we get uh, different types of rearrangements uh, as we have seen, for example, in the UV reaction. Then the isocyanide group uh, is also strongly electron withdrawing and therefore um, um, we can easily form a cup anion um, by the protonation of the alpha um, uh, hydrogen. And, uh, and uh, this is then leading to addition and cyclization chemistry. For example, the Van Leusen reaction, the Van Leusen three component reaction with tosmic derivatives uh, uh, to form um, three fold substituted imidat salts is uh, such an example. Uh, the last uh, reaction pathway which isocyanides can undergo is uh, radical formation, and these radicals then undergo addition and cyclization reactions. And here on the right hand side, you see another. A crystal structure of a isocyanide, which is quite interesting because it's so highly functionalized. It has a, a carboxy um, transportyl ester, an isocyanide, alpha beta unsaturation, and a leaving group in uh, in the beta position. And uh, again, the same feature. So you have a short nitrogen carbon bond, which uh, corresponds to a triple bond, and we have a 180 degree angle between the carbon, the nitrogen, and the carbon. So if we are trying to understand uh, this, uh, this uh, unusual functional group behavior of the isocyanides, we can, for example, have a look at the frontal orbitals uh, of the isocyanide functionality and compare them with the frontal orbitals of the nitrile, the isomeric nitrile. So here, these are the filled um, uh, HOMO orbitals, which is a pi orbital and a sigma orbital. And here we have the pi star orbital, which is the LUMO. Um, so we can see that uh, the electron density of the sigma orbital in the case of the isocyanides is sitting on the carbon, which means an uh, electrophile would attack the carbon. And at the same time, based uh, on the orbital coefficients, the size of the orbital, we can also see that the largest uh, p lobe, uh, um, p star lobe uh, of, uh, of the isocyanides is also sitting on the carbon. And this is the reason why also a 
um, a nucleophile would attack uh, the carbon and not the nitrogen. And in the case of the uh, nitriles, the isomeric nitriles, it's different because uh, the, the P star lobe uh, is the biggest on the carbon and, uh, and, uh, and the P lobe uh, of the HOMO is the largest on the nitrogen. And therefore, of course, uh, there's this distinction between the reactivity of the C and the N in the nitriles. Okay, so um, we are interested in all types of isocyanide chemistries, and we were asking the question why um, the isocyanide was never used in nucleophilic substitution reactions. So here we have a simple scheme of a, of a nucleophilic substitution reaction. So you have a nucleophile negatively charged, you have an alkyl halide, uh, and the substituted product and the halide uh, leaving group. So the, we, we, we asked the question if it's possible to react an isocyanide with an alkyl halide uh, in the presence of water in order to stabilize the nitrilium ion, which we form intermediately, um, for example, with water, and then to get this uh, imide. So that was the idea. And uh, this was the initial uh, reaction we were performing. So we were uh, reacting in, in, in benzyl bromide with this benzyl isocyanide in order to get this uh, imide coupling uh, on the right hand side. And uh, the initial attempts to perform this reaction were positive, but uh, we got very, very low yield. So we could see the product uh, in, in, in the mass spec, but uh, we could not isolate it. Uh, so the, we had to optimize uh, the reaction and we were using high throughput experimentation methods, uh, simple methods, uh, which are shown here at the bottom. So we were running many, many reactions in parallel uh, under different conditions. And the different conditions are described here. So we were optimizing the time, we were optimizing the temperature, we were optimizing the solvents and mixtures of the different solvents, the water content. Uh, we were using different types of uh, heatings, uh, conventional heatings, microwave heating, uh, like you can see here. We were using and screening uh, organic and inorganic uh, bases. Uh, and uh, most importantly, we were also um, um, screening different um, different uh, 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 other compounds, adducts, um, for example, phase transfer catalysts. We, we screened more than 12 different phase transfer catalysts and uh, potassium iodide uh, um, in order to increase the yield of, uh, of, the, of, of the reaction. So, the best conditions for a more minimal uh, scale reaction were found uh, to be this in the box, and uh, this is uh, two equivalents of uh, of uh, the base of this inorganic base, potassium carbonate, uh, 20 mole percent uh, of potassium isocyanide. Uh, the solvent uh, was acetonitrile, two milliliter. We used a very um, few amount uh, of water uh, in order to circumvent uh, hydrolysis of the alkyl uh, of the benzyl bromide uh, to the benzyl alcohol and also in order to um, um, in order to minimize the side reaction of the hydrolysis of the isocyanides and the reaction is best performed in microwave at uh, around 100 degree uh, three hours at least uh, this was the best conditions for this combination so then next we went on to um, to look into the substrate called uh, scope of the alkyl halides and uh, so these are all uh, one millimole scale reactions we performed. Uh, uh, we kept uh, uh, adamantyl isocyanide as uh, as uh, as the um, as the fixed um, isocyanide component, and you can see that uh, classical substrates uh, from SN2 reactions like allyl iodide uh, or allyl bromide uh, are nicely working. Benzyl groups are nicely working, but also this protecting group here can be easily introduced. Uh, interestingly, we could also get uh, quite some numbers number of uh, uh, heterocyclic uh, to work uh, like this uh, benzimidazole, uh, um, um, pyrazole, uh, coumarin derivatives, uh, triazole derivatives, uh, and, uh, and this uh, quinoline and uh, or a very small substitute uh, like uh, methyl iodide. Uh, and uh, we were um, um, quite, uh, pleased to see that uh, quite some functional groups uh, are compatible, like uh, if we have a bisbenzyl chloride, uh, then uh, only one of the positions uh, can get to reaction 
uh, nitriles are compatible. And uh, this is an interesting case because here the free aldehyde group uh, in the starting material um, is not making any problems. Uh, and also here, as you can see, so we will see this later on. For some of the compounds, we were able to get uh, crystal structures. They are uh, now uh, deposited in the CCDC. <clears throat> Next, we went into the substrate uh, substrate uh, scope of the isocyanides. Uh, so here we kept the uh, methyl iodide as a constant uh, partner uh, for the SN2 reaction. And you can see that, uh, that um, 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 benzyl isocyanides uh, with all types of uh, functional groups work nicely, theophanes, uh, uh, furans, uh, other type of heterocycles like this, uh, pyridine, uh, phenyl isocyanides also work nicely. Um, and uh, here at the bottom, you see a couple of examples where we uh, reacted uh, basic isocyanides uh, like uh, morpholinopropyl isocyanide. And uh, if we do this in the presence of uh, methyl iodide, uh, then of course we get also uh, alkylation of the nitrogen and we get the formation of this uh, N-acetyl um quaternary salt uh, of uh, the morpholino group uh, here on the bottom right you see two examples where we could uh, react amino acids uh, amino acid derived isocyanide uh, with uh, methyl iodide and then we were running some uh, mixed examples uh, in these mixed examples there are some uh, interesting features. For example, here we have a cyclopropyl group, uh, which is uh, stable under these conditions. Uh, again, the free aldehyde group. Uh, this compound we were making with the, with the knowledge that uh, this compound most likely is a, a PD, PDL1, uh, PD1, PDL1 antagonist. Uh, this is an important anti-cancer target where we are working on. And uh, this compound is currently co-crystallized in Krakow for PDL1. And here on the right hand side, uh, I think this is also interesting. Uh, we used uh, fatty acid uh, isocyanides, uh, fatty acid derived isocyanides, and uh, you can see they also nicely work uh, under these conditions. Okay, so then uh, we were um, uh, looking into scaling. Uh, can we scale this reaction? Here we were running uh, the reaction of these two partners uh, and on a 10 millimole scale under these conditions. And uh, we could isolate uh, 1.6 gram of this uh, free aldehyde group. Uh, um, building block and this free aldehyde group, of course, uh, we can use in further multi-component reactions, and this is what is shown here. So we were using the compound, uh, the free aldehyde group, in a classic UV reaction. We were using the free aldehyde group in a GBD three-component reaction to get this material or in the UV tetrazole reaction at the bottom. So this is a very nice uh, um, illustration how this uh, using multi-component reaction from very, very simple starting material in only two steps, you can get uh, incredibly complex uh, type of, uh, of, uh, of materials. Um, uh, what you see here on the bottom and all of these compounds are drug-like compounds. So this is the typical um, um, size and uh, shape of, uh, of a drug uh, which is on the market. So in my opinion, multi-component reaction chemistry is a very, very nice uh, way to use uh, in, in drug discovery. So we also could prove that uh, we can do late stage uh, fun functionalization. So here we did a SN2 reaction with uh, this um, uh, uh, alpha blocker, which is on the market, uh, phenoxybenzamine. Um, sorry. Um, so uh, this is uh, how we believe uh, uh, the mechanism of this uh, reaction is. So we first get a, a nucleophilic attack of the is isocyanide from the backside uh, of the leaving group. Uh, then we get this uh, trigonal bipyramidal uh, transition state uh, where the car carbon is attacking the carbon of the of the alkyl halide and uh, the halide, uh, the chloride is still attached somehow. And then uh, the chloride is, is leaving and we get this uh, nitrilium ion intermediate species. And this uh, nitrilium ion is then hydrolyzed uh, by water. And after this tautomerization, we get the amide bond formation. So, um, 
uh, let's uh, let's now discuss a little bit uh, the chemical space. Uh, what is the chemical space uh, and how is the chemical space different from uh, the classical imide coupling? So here at the bottom, you see uh, the typical structure of the imide, this uh, secondary imide, and, uh, and this uh, dotted line is showing the classical way of the imide coupling. So we have a, a, a negatively charged nitrogen and a positively charged carbon of the of, uh, of the carboxy group uh, as the symptoms. And, uh, and here on the left-hand side, uh, the solid line is showing the new SN2 reaction. And the interesting point I would like to make here is that we have a umpulled, uh, uh, umpulung uh, in the synton. So we have a, a formamide uh, carbania ion formally, and we have a positively charged uh, R. Uh, or three, uh, which is coming from the halide. Uh, um, so, um, what is the chemical space? The chemical space, of course, is dependent on the isocytes. As you know, there are not many commercial available isocytes, so you have to synthesize the isocytes. And isocytes are typically um, produced from the primary amine by the Ugi Hoffmann method, uh, formulation, dehydration, or they can be made by the Leukert Wallach uh, um, reaction, which is uh, reductive amidation with formamide and then uh, dehydration. So, we get uh, these two types of uh, isocytes. So one of the questions uh, one can ask is uh, how how much different are the two chemical spaces? Uh, so uh, boxed in, in red here is the classical chemical space uh, of the imide coupling. And in green, uh, we are dependent on these uh, alkyl halides and uh, the isocyanides. Um, the alkyl halides, uh, the chlorine, bromine, and iodine, so good leading groups. Uh, one, 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 so one can ask the question, what is the, what does it mean financially if we want to make the same imide, uh, but by the two different methods? So from the carboxylic acid and the primary amine, or from the alkyl halide and the isocyanide? And then it turns out uh, that uh, these kind of ice, uh, these kind of carboxylic acids always are much, much, much more expensive than the corresponding halide. So you can say that, uh, that economically speaking, um, it could be an advantage of using this uh, new method. And then we also uh, were thinking and we were um, calculating how, how many compounds uh, you can make uh, in the classical way uh, from the carboxylic acid and the uh, primary amine. Uh, so we took a catalog, a chemical catalog, and we did all the possible combinations of the carboxylic acids which are in this catalog and the corresponding primary amines. So we come up with uh, 3.8 million different compounds you can make uh, by the classical imide coupling, or you can make 4.2 million uh, compounds uh, by using alkyl halides. So again, chloride, bromide, iodide uh, with the corresponding isocyanides, which are uh, produced from the primary amines or the aldehydes and ketones. And uh, most importantly is that the overlap of the two chemical spaces is only 1 million compounds. So uh, only 1 million compounds from commercial starting material can be made uh, by, by the two different uh, methods. Uh, so that means uh, there are, uh, are 3.8 uh, million compounds which cannot be made by the classical uh, imide coupling from commercial available starting material and vice versa. There are 2.8 million uh, imides, uh, imide uh, couplings which you cannot make by the new method. So this is showing you that indeed, uh, indeed uh, we are talking about uh, two different uh, chemical spaces uh, for this uh, new reaction as compared to the old ways to make uh, imide couplings. All right, uh, and then we were also looking a little bit, uh, so this is very new results into uh, uh, nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions of uh, isocyanides. This is also possible and interestingly has never been described before. So here we have a very activated uh, um, electron um, pure uh, phenyl fluoride uh, and uh, in, the, in the presence of uh, potassium carbonate uh, acetonitrile, uh, we can get 70% uh, of this uh, in might uh, at the end. And here are different um, examples. Um, 
Good. So, and now let's switch gears. And uh, in the last part of my, my lecture, I want to show you a little bit about our automated uh, miniaturized uh, drug discovery platform, which we call Amadeus. Uh, so the, this is uh, still a theory, so it's still not uh, functional, but I hope that I can build it in, in Olomouc in Palatsky University. So this uh, platform is uh, consisting on a, of a nanoscale, high to put the synthesis part, uh, quality control and purification of the synthesis by using uh, UPLC and then screening of the compounds and this data of the screening, the synthesis, the quality control uh, is, uh, is, um, is then uh, uh, feedback by some kind of artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning algorithm in order to drive the optimization of the corresponding chemical space. So this is the idea. And let's see what uh, we have done so far. So as, uh, as Valentin was mentioning in the beginning, in the mantra in our lab is miniaturization and automation is leading to acceleration. So we are using this uh, acoustic dispensing platform, which is shown here schematically on the right hand side. So there is uh, a 384 well plate uh, where acoustic waves are leading to the formation of nanoliter droplets, 2.5 nanoliter droplets. And these 2.5 nanoliter droplets can be uh, transported into another 384 well plate or 1536 well plate uh, in different combinations to form the corresponding uh, product. So this is an interesting way to make chemistry. It's a contactless uh, liquid transfer technology. It's extremely fast. Uh, so the droplet formation goes much faster than 20 Hertz. And we have these uh, 2.5 nanoliter droplets. So we can easily make thousands to 10,000 of compounds per day. And it's a fully autonomous uh, uh, automated uh, platform. So here on the on the on the left hand side bottom, you see you see a typical three component reaction. So the upper upper uh, 384 well plate contains the building blocks, uh, and uh, and this is a real time movie. And you can see how these uh, 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 three different types of components are are, um, are uh, um, filled in, in, in the reaction plate, which is here at the bottom, so to form 384 compounds. So in a couple of minutes, uh, this uh, 384 well plate is uh, filled with uh, typically uh, 100 uh, nanoliter up to 500 uh, nanoliter uh, per, per reaction. And what you see here at the bottom right is the high throughput analytics. Uh, so this is also using acoustic dispensing. The crude reaction mixtures are shot inside uh, the head of a mass spectrometer. So this is a technology which a couple of years was not commercially available. There were only six machines worldwide, uh, uh, three in South San Francisco and uh, three here in Europe. And uh, we have done this in, together with a in a, in a collaboration with AstraZeneca. So you can also see that uh, this is a very fast way to make analytics of the wells of the 384 well plates. So basically you can shoot uh, uh, three reactions uh, per second uh, into the mass spectrum to do the analysis. Okay, so let me show you a couple of examples. So that was a, a new isoquinoline synthesis uh, we were designing uh, on the blackboard and uh, transferring it uh, to nanoscale in order to find out uh, if the reaction is uh, working in order to optimize the reaction conditions and uh, show scope limitation. And this work was done by Yuan Zi Wang, uh, who is now a, a, a professor at the university in China. So the idea was to use this uh, glyoxal monoacetal and react it with all types of uh, benzylamines, uh, electron benzylamines uh, and benzoic acid and isocyanides in, in methanol. Uh, as, a, as a solvent. So then we get uh, this uh, type of um, intermediate uh, UGI for component reaction intermediate, which is not isolated, uh, but hydrolysis is happening uh, with HCl and dioxane and uh, oxidation at the same time that we get this uh, isoquinoline. So that was the idea. And here on the right hand side, you see the kind of uh, building blocks we were using in, together with acoustic dispensing on this uh, high throughput uh, synthesis uh, unit. Uh, so one of them is, of course, the aldehyde, and the acid component uh, is also fixed. Uh, we were using these eight uh, different uh, uh, heterobenzylamines and benzylamines, all electron rich with uh, methoxy groups, and uh, these uh, 70 different uh, isocyanides. 
and this is um, they, they they were then combined in a in a in a in a um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a certain fashion in this uh, 384 word plate and this is how the analytics looks like uh, so this mass spectrometry of course you cannot quantify um, the reaction outcome but uh, you can only say yes the reaction is the major product uh, for example or it is it is formed uh, here shown in yellow or we cannot find the reaction at all and you can see that uh, the the quality of the reaction is uh, pretty good so in the in in, in 80 percent of the reaction 70 80 percent of the reactions uh, the product is formed and uh, even as a major product uh, and uh, in some 20 percent uh, of the reactions uh, product is not formed so um here, that is uh, another work uh, from Li Gao, which uh, got her PhD recently. And uh, what we tried to do here was a high diversity library of um, by using 16 different uh, independent reaction in part on a 1536 well plate. So this 1536 well plate was partitioned into a 1696 well plate. And in each of these 96 well plate, a different type of chemistry was running. So the classical Pasarini, Ugi, Tetrazole synthesis, Preparations and so on and so on. So all of them were fed from one uh, building block, um, uh, 384 well plate uh, library. And uh, one of the big advantages uh, when you do this kind of chemistry in the nanoliter scale is that uh, you are using very few materials. So the total reagent and solvent consumption uh, for this 1536 well plate was less than 20 milligram. And this is uh, quite in, in, important uh, economically because uh, uh, in most of the pharma companies, uh, synthesis is still done, even parallel synthesis is still done on a millimole scale, like 0 0.5 millimole, 0 0.2 millimole. And uh, you know that uh, the building blocks, uh, which you, for example, can get uh, from, from enamine, they are quite expensive. So if you have a 96 well plate of, uh, of building blocks, uh, which you need in order to make this kind of scale of reaction, uh, that easily costs you 10,000 euros. Uh, so this, uh, and here we only talk about 20 milligram uh, total reagent consumption. So this uh, is uh, the difference. Okay, let me in the last couple of minutes show you a couple of examples um, uh, applications to medicine and chemistry so one of the strengths in my lab is uh, equivalent uh, library production so we were interested in equivalent inhibitors um, made by by multiple component reaction chemistry and this has been published in 2021 in science advance so, for example, here are two acrylamides uh, which are now on the market. Uh, Bulkinza is a kinase inhibitor for the treatment of cancer, and NG550 is a, a RAS um, G12C, uh, RAS, sorry, RAS G12C um, inhibitor, and the crystal structure you can see here on the right hand side. So, the traditional way to make these acrylamides or uh, uh, compounds with um, uh, electrophile warheads is you are performing a multiceptor synthesis and that at the end um, you introduce your equivalent uh, warhead so this is a late stage functionalization approach it's lengthy uh, has rather low diversity and you can produce only a low number the way we do the chemistry is of course using multi component reaction chemistry shown here which is convergent short uh, diverse atom economically and uh, we have uh, many, many different scaffolds, not only the UGI uh, for component uh, reaction scaffold, but uh, basically there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, multi component reaction described, uh, which gives different types of uh, scaffolds. And in this paper, we described uh, the introduction of uh, different types of uh, electrophiles like nitrides, uh, acyl chlorides. Uh, uh, sulfonyl fluorides, alpha beta unsaturated uh, uh, um, carbonyl groups or uh, sulfone groups, sulf sulfonamide groups, uh, or boronic acids. Then we have our linker portion, and then we have uh, and then we have our our building blocks, uh, which are, have the typical functional groups you use in the multiple reaction chemistry. So let me show you two different ways how you can do this uh, equivalent library. Here in this uh, left-hand part, we were running a Ugi, uh, sorry, a Pasarini reaction between acrylic acid, uh, different aldehydes, different isocyanides, and n-pentan as a solvent uh, with TFE. 
and uh, this is the scaffold um, uh, you get and uh, and um, this is a 96 well plate uh, where the the, the the compounds you you, you see around uh, these 96 well plates are all formed by precipitation and uh, so you get a high quality uh, pure uh, material in pretty good yields however all the other compounds were also isolated by chromatography and thereby we can since this was done on a 0 0.5 millimole scale we can weight uh, uh, the products and uh, really determine the yields and you can see that in this Pasarini um, uh, plate uh, mostly the yields are between uh, 60 and 95 percent and uh, between 20 and uh, 50 percent <clears throat> so this was done in uh, glass wilds in 96 well plates using um, multi-channel uh, simple technologies uh, and uh, so the typical throughput uh, for this kind of uh, synthesis is uh, 196 well plate per week uh, we can produce uh, 50 to 100 milligram a purified product uh, per well and uh, all the compounds are tested by proton NMR and by LCMS. And then on the right hand side, you, you see a similar type of chemistry also based on acrylamides, uh, but this uh, synthesis was now performed on uh, uh, using acoustic droplet uh, ejection technology on a nanoliter scale. The throughput is much, much higher because you can easily perform 10, 15, 36 per plates per day or even more, but uh, the products are unpurified uh, because purification at that scale is uh, demanding and uh, costly and um, we do not have the the technology currently to do this. So here is an uh, application. So we were interested very early on, already three years ago, in uh, the SARS-CoV-2, um, um, which is uh, the causing agent of COVID-19. So we were interested in the main protease, uh, FreeCL Pro, and this is a crystal structure of the main protease surface presentation. And what you see here in yellow is the cysteine of the active site. And the active site uh, contains this uh, catalytic diode, which is consisting of histidine 41 and cysteine uh, 145. And uh, we were able to produce uh, um, the main protease uh, and express it in E. coli in very good yields and uh, were able to purify uh, the protein and crystallize it. So here you see microscopic pictures uh, of, uh, of the main protease, uh, the crystals. And we were using these crystals in order to soak uh, the compound libraries we have produced. Uh, and you can see here in this um, um, in this work, which was uh, published in Angiwante Kimi in 2001, we were able to get uh, five crystal structures out of 200 uh, different compounds, which we tried to soak into the upper crystals. And uh, some of them, as you can see um, by this enzyme inhibition assay, were pretty potent compound. For example, F2 had a IC50 of 2.3 uh, micromolar. You see here. Okay, and this was done in collaboration with the Paul Scherer Institute in Fillingen in Switzerland. So the chemistry was uh, performed on site. And uh, that is the first time that uh, we had an integration of high throughput chemistry and high throughput uh, crystallography in the so called DMTA cycle. DMTA stands for Design, Make, Test, Analyze Cycle. So the typical cycle, which is done in pharma industry to uh, optimize compounds. So this is shown here on the left hand side uh, the DMTA cycle. So Design, Make, Test, Analyze. And uh, with our um, technology platform, the Amadeus, we have the idea that we can automate this design, make, test, analyze cycle, which is uh, quite costly and uh, uh, in, 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 in pharma industry and, uh, and lengthy. So one uh, cycle round typically takes several weeks. And uh, of course, you have to perform many of these cycles uh, in order to come up with a compound which then you can administer to humans. Um, so we are using uh, so-called um, uh, genetic algorithms uh, and uh, machine, other type of machine learning algorithms in order to mimic uh, this design, make, test, analyze cycle. Um, one example is shown here. So this is a simulation which is based on uh, calculations, uh, based on uh, uh, docking calculations. So the target here was uh, to find inhibitors for the IL-17A 
um, dimerization. So this is a very important information uh, target. And what you see here on the y-axis is the potency of the compound. So the lower the number, the more potent the compound is. And each of these red dots is one compound. And what you see in these bottles is one generation. Okay, so this is a generation approach, uh, as we have seen in this TMTA cycle. Um, this is um, each of these bottles is one cycle. So you can see that uh, over the time, uh, the compounds uh, continuously improve uh, for the binding affinity to IL-17, and you can see after after 15, uh, diff 50 different cycles, uh, we are at a minimum. And uh, the chemical space we are investigating here is a classical UGI for component reaction based on uh, these uh, type of building blocks we have available in my lab. So almost 2,000 different isocyanides, 800 aldehydes, 2,400 primary amines, and 1,500 uh, carboxylic acids. So we are talking about a very large chemical space of uh, 10 to the power of 12 uh, molecules, uh, which is uh, formed by these uh, four different components. But in reality, we only have... Uh, 50 compounds, or in this case, uh, 25 compounds per uh, cycle, and we can get the optimization after 50 cycles. So we have to synthesize much, much, much less and test much less compounds than, uh, than the chemical space. So this is, uh, of course, the basis of this uh, algorithm, which is um, helping to optimize the corresponding chemical space. Okay, so let me summarize. Uh, um, the Amadeus platform is shown here again. It's uh, Amadeus stands for Automated, Miniaturized, and Accelerated Drug Discovery, and is consisting of this uh, um, 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 acoustic droplet ejection technology. So we have on the fly synthesis uh, for each project, new synthesis. So we are not. Uh, um, the idea is not to, to store the compound libraries, but to make them fresh for each project. Uh, we have a very large chemical space, but based on multiple component reactions, but other type of uh, reactions as well. We also have performed uh, CC coupling, palladium uh, CC couplings, uh, for example, on this uh, platform. It is nanosynthesis, so we need a very few material. We can easily make uh, 1,000 compounds per day. Uh, very diverse chemistry and uh, each of the compound, if they show as a hit, can be scaled afterwards. Then we have the quality control and, uh, and the uh, platform, which is helping to um, purify the compounds. Uh, so this is fast, uh, MS-based, uh, UPLC MS-based. And, um, and then we have the screening. Mm, this can be biophysical screening. It can be high throughput crystallography, as I have shown you, or a phenotypical screening. And, uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, now the cycle time can be reduced to one day instead of several weeks. So this is a project which is, uh, will be ongoing then in Olomouc's um, in my new place. And uh, with this, I. I'm stopping here. Um, the camera is not working. This is, uh, I, I'm, I'm not um, looking like this anymore. In the meantime, I'll, I'm a little bit older. I have gray hairs. <laughs> um, this is my new address, uh, Palatsky University um, at the Katrin Research Institute uh, in Olomouc, uh, where I will be housed uh, from next year on. And uh, I have this uh, ERA chair, which is a big uh, grant from the European Union. And with this, uh, with this money, we will hire a lot of uh, PhD students and uh, postdocs. So if you are interested in, or maybe you want to show it to your students, uh, I would be very grateful for this. And with this, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much for your nice presentation and for your new address and inviting to join your group as a PhD students and postdocs. So dear colleagues, we have time for questions. Do you have any? About topic of uh, presentation or about uh, postdocs? Uh, yeah, Alex, concerning your new um, SN2 reaction, uh, did you try to apply it for synthesis of chiral compounds? That's a good question because uh, the SN2 reaction, of course, uh, is uh, is uh, giving an inversion, uh, the van Walden umkehr, right? And uh, and you should see uh, inversion. Um, so that is um, we did not perform this yet. Uh, 
um, the, the, the cheapest uh, chiral compounds you can use for this purpose are alcohols, which you are converting them to a leaving group, uh, like a tosylate, uh, mesylate, uh, triflate, or something like this. But uh, um, it turned out that uh, that the SN2 reaction with uh, these kind of substrates is very messy, and we cannot isolate uh, uh, the products uh, nicely. So we are now looking into commercial available um, uh, into commercial uh, available chlorides. Um, so th this is ongoing, but not yet done. So I cannot tell you if we have uh, inversion or not. Uh, I mean, based on the mechanism, we should have uh, inversion, but uh, of course we have to prove it. But, uh, in other respects, it very much be uh, it very much. Uh, um, uh, is like a SN2 reaction. For example, you have a very strong uh, uh, substrate dependency. So if you have a better substitution in the alkyl halide, uh, then the reaction is uh, not working uh, and so on and so on. So if there is sterically hindrance, uh, it is not working. So, and uh, if you look into the alkyl, uh, allyl, allyl halides, for example, then uh, the iodides are reacting best so then the bromides and then the chlorides. Uh, and um, we also did, uh, we also did uh, the reaction in presence of uh, tempo in order to um, eliminate eventually a radical mechanism and uh, there is no difference in the absence or presence uh, of tempo and uh, so we are pretty convinced that uh, this is a SN2 reaction. Uh -huh, okay and uh, when you compare a, a classical way of uh, synthesis of amides and u way so is it also a difference because you practically cannot use uh, chiral compounds but in the classical way you can use chiral uh, acids so um pa -pa -pa -pa, let me see when you compare this uh, chemical spaces between classical yes um mm -hmm. you can you can use uh in in classical way you can use uh, a lot of uh, chiral acids if you have also, of course here is no ach2 group between air and uh, coh mm -hmm. in... this, this is uh, this is um, um, exactly so here in this uh, pictures we try to um uh, compare the two methods um, to to make exactly the same compounds by the two methods okay okay yes i understand oh. yeah okay dear dear colleagues maybe somebody has a question i have a question uh -huh. victoria please hi victoria uh, hi hi <laughs> uh hi hi alexandra uh nice to see you very much and thank you for your very interesting um, presentation and my question is uh, how you pre purified uh, the products of uh, high throughput synthesis uh, you obtained um, these substances in very small amounts mm -hmm. uh, do you use uh, chromatographic methods or other mm -hmm. um we are not purifying the compounds of the high throughput synthesis because um, if you want to do um, um, purification on a nanoliter scale, this needs very special, expensive uh, instrumentation, mm. but it is possible. So um, I applied for a grant uh, to, to buy this instrumentation. So uh, UPLC driven, uh, MS driven UPLC um, and from Waters, and uh, they claim that uh, they have instruments which can do the purification mm -hmm. on this scale. But uh, these kind of instruments are quite expensive, so they are easily 400,000 uh, euros, and uh, I don't have this kind of money currently, and uh, therefore the, 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 the compounds are not uh, purified. Uh. Mm -hmm. And uh, you uh, adopted your reaction uh, to obtain uh, only target product. Um, Sorry, I did not get the question, but what was it? And you uh, adopted your reaction mm -hmm. and um, for obtain only target product without, without uh, other um, compounds. 
well, if 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 you are, for example, running this ESO kinolin synthesis, um, then uh, this is done on the nanoscale, um, and uh, and then in order to prove that the reaction is also working uh, at a millimole scale, we pick uh, compounds randomly from the green. Um, from the green uh, uh, wells, and uh, we scale them to millimole scale or even to 10 millimole scale in some cases uh, in order to get them the purified product. But this mm -hmm. is done in the classical way. So this is done uh, in normal flasks, and uh, the purification is done by, by chromatography, by chemical. Yes, yes, I understand. You use oh. only green products. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Raj. I have a question. Can I? May I? Sorry. Yeah, of course. I'm very curious about the way of crystallization of compounds um, when you are working in the nanoliter scales. What is exactly the way of obtaining crystals? Um, you you mean the co-crystallization with the with the, with the protein? This one. Yes, you show the crystal structures. Yes. Yes. So, uh, um, that is that was done at the synchrotron in uh, in uh, in Switzerland, and uh, and the way you do this, uh, you have uh, different wells uh, where you have the upper crystals inside, and uh, you are also using acoustic dispensing in order to shoot. Uh, Highly concentrated uh, solutions of uh, of your compounds next to the crystals in order to enhance the chances that you get uh, binding to the protein, and uh, th this is very important that you are using very highly concentrated uh, uh, sock solutions of your compound and that you are using acoustic dispensing in order to shoot. Then you get a very uh, high local concentration of. Uh, of uh, of the compounds uh, next to the protein crystals, and this is enhancing the chances that uh, something is uh, then binding to and, and showing showing in the crystal structure analysis and the differential map. Thank you. As far as I understand, uh, the probability of this kind of binding is not so huge, or it's very successful. Is it very successful method? I mean, each each time you can obtain the crystal, so it's just a by a question of luck. Um, I mean, we have um, this is the, the approach is a soaking approach. So we have the upper crystal. So we have huge numbers of upper crystals, and uh, in each well, we have uh, a couple of upper crystals, and then uh, the stock solutions uh, of of the small molecules are shot next to the next to the crystal that we get a very high local concentration and uh, then it depends of course of the on the affinity of the small molecules if you if you can get binding or not on the other hand uh, the 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 success rate was uh, five crystal structures out of uh, 200 different compounds uh, i think this is not bad uh, on the other hand um, i can also not tell you um, how many of the uh, 200 compounds uh, are binding uh, or inhibiting the cysteine protease because we did not measure it. Uh, so we measured it only for the five co-crystal structures we got. Okay, thank you for your very detailed. Uh, five crystal structures out of 200 compounds, I think is not bad at all. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's a very great result. I think. Yes, it's a nice result, I think. <laughs> Okay. Other questions, comments? This um, this picture here also shows you a little bit the strengths and uh, the weakness of uh, of uh, of co-crystal structures uh, or crystallography because you can see that uh, compound number five, uh, uh, which is the UGI product uh, F three. Um, is, uh, is, is basically not inhibiting the uh, protease at all, but it shows in the crystal and it is binding to the active site. Um, however, compound F2, the number four, is a pretty potent uh, compound for a random library with 2.3 micromolar inhibition constant. Uh -huh. Good. Thank you. Oh, I don't see uh, hands.
and uh, the Alex, uh, thank you very much again for your very nice presentation. For me, as organic chemist, it's, it's very interesting. And uh, I think we can stop our uh, seminar today. Again, thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, I I really hope uh, the best for you that this uh, terrible war is uh, stopping as soon as possible, and uh, that you can push the Russians back to where they belong to. <laughs> thank you very much for for your support and for your kind words. So have a nice evening. Thank you very much. And I hope we will see you in Kharkiv in that the future. Would be wonderful, yes. Okay, bye-bye.